Hey folks, it's Mark Smith of the Four Boxes Diner here. I'm going to play for you in just one second a one hour long video of an event I did, a telephone uh, telephone conference, if you will, video conference for the Federal Society. I think you'll find this quite interesting. This was talking about uh, where I talked to law clerks, lawyers, uh, academics, and whoever participated about the consequences and the significance of the United States versus Rahimi Second Amendment decision and how to understand and how to put in the context of constitutional law and so on. And I thought you would enjoy hearing it here. So I asked the Federal Society if I had permission to play it on my channel for all you. And they said absolutely. So I'm going to play it for you right here and right now. And feel free to give me your comments and let me know if you agree or disagree with some of the things I said at this event for the Federal Society. We'll talk to you soon. Welcome to the Spetsock Forum webinar call. Today, June 26, 2024, we're delighted to host a Courthouse Steps Decision Program on United States versus Rahimi, which was decided last week by the court. My name is Caleb Kleist, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the expert on today's program, as the Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. Now in the interest of time, I'll keep my introduction to our guest today brief. But if you'd like to know more, you can access his impressive full bio at fedsoc.org. Today we are fortunate to have with us Professor Mark Smith, who is Professor of Law at Ave Maria School of Law, a visiting fellow at the Department of Pharmacology at Oxford University, and the host of the Four Boxes Diner channel on YouTube, whose Second Amendment videos have been viewed over 33 million times. Additionally, Mark's Second Amendment scholarship has been cited by federal courts and by lawyers before the U.S. Supreme Court in both Nyserpa versus Bruin, Bruin excuse me, and the United States versus Rahim. He is a New York Times bestselling author, and his most recent book is Israel Disarmed, What October 7th Attacks Can Teach Americans About the Right to Bear Arms. He is also a regular guest on Fox News Channel. I'll leave it there. One last note, and then I'll get off your screen so we can get into a time of opening remarks. If you have questions, please do submit them by the question and answer feature found at the bottom of the Zoom screen so it'll be accessible when we get to that extended portion of today's webinar. With that, thank you all for joining us today. Mark, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Kayla, and thank you for the Federalist Society for uh, hearing me today and uh, inviting me today. So this is an extremely important case, United States versus Rahimi, and I'm going to break it down for you, give you the narrow holding issues, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how it fits into the context or the fabric of modern-day Second Amendment jurisprudence. To begin with, let's just start with the question that was presented in the United States versus Rahimi. And really the question was whether federal gun control law 18 U.S.C. 922 G8 on its face, and that's very important what I just said, on its face, it was a facial challenge, whether or not it's constitutional under the Second Amendment's right of the people to keep and bear arms. And specifically, uh, the subsection 922 G8 provides, in essence, that if you are subject to what's known as a domestic violence restraining order, after that order had been entered, when you had an opportunity to be heard, you were aware of the hearing. You you had you went to the hearing in the case of Mr. Rahimi, and uh, there's a finding of fact, finding a fact that you present a credible threat of physical violence toward another. Then the entry of that order takes place. It can occur in state court. Usually, it is state court because of the nature of domestic violence uh, restraining orders, of course. And then once that triggers. You, under the federal statute, 18 U.S.C. 922G, you are not permitted to possess firearms. So once a domestic violence restraint order that meets the statutory criteria is triggered, you are denied the ability to have or possess firearms under the federal law, even if that restraining order was initially, and usually they are, entered by, let's say, a state or a local court. Now, the Supreme Court's holding in Rahimi, and then we're going to back up in, for a second talk about how it got here. The holding is actually quite narrow. Specifically, uh, the holding says that 18 U.S.C. 922 G8 is constitutional under the Second Amendment, and it cannot be knocked out as a facial matter where an individual, specifically the individual making the Second Amendment challenge, um, has been found by a court to pose a credible threat a credible threat to the physical safety of a third party. And there they may be, and this is very important, temporarily, temporarily disarmed. Now that holding has three critical components to it. The first is, of course, 
uh, that it made clear the Roberts court, and this was an eight to one decision, uh, although in many respects it was nine to zero. We'll get, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this eight to one decision written by Chief Justice John Roberts, uh, really, if you look at the holding, there's three kind of narrowing components to it. The first is they specifically indicated it was a narrow holding. They specifically wrote in the opinion that we conclude only that, again, an individual found by a court to pose a credible threat to the physical safety of another can be temporarily disarmed. So there's, in addition to the fact it's a narrow holding, one also has to look at the holding and realize that they specifically said there has to be a court finding presumably after a due process it, uh, uh, is presented and allowed. And not only does there have to be due process, meaning because it has to be a finding, it, you can only be disarmed temporarily, which is quite significant because if you look at the rest of the relevant statute, uh, 922G, there's a whole list of people that are disarmed, many of whom that fall within the list are disarmed for the rest of their lives. There are lifetime bans. So I think it's somewhat significant. And we'll see how significant going down the road. Uh, but it seems quite significant that the Supreme Court, in its holding in Rahimi, uh, made reference to the fact that you could be temporarily disarmed as to what temporary means. Uh, certainly in the context of the Rahimi case, that means presumably that during the time period where Mr. Rahimi himself posed a credible threat to a third party, he could be disarmed. Now, that's the nuts and bolts uh, holding and uh, of the question presented. Now, what does all this mean, and how did it all? How, how does all this come about? Well, in my view, I think that the Rahimi case is significant uh, for the Second Amendment uh, world of jurisprudence because it really shows a shift from the Supreme Court Second Amendment jurisprudence being what I would call pathbreaking or groundbreaking on the one hand, and more into the world of pedestrian individualized decision making. And what I mean by that is that um, if you look at the prior Second Amendment cases, the 2008 Second Amendment decision by the Supreme Court in Heller, that was somewhat of a groundbreaking decision in that it said that there was an individual right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment. Then you look at 2010, you had again another sort of groundbreaking decision that says the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental, one of the most fundamental rights one can have as an American citizen, and therefore it applies pursuant to the 14th Amendment to the states and localities who must respect it under the law. Then you look at the 2016 decision of Caetano versus Massachusetts, and there they emphasize that modern arms, modern arms and not just firearms, are protected by the Second Amendment. In that case, it was talking about stun guns uh, conceptually being protected by the Second Amendment, and they remanded that back down to the Massachusetts Supreme Court. And again, the Caetano case 2016 saying that modern weaponry is as protected no different than modern forms of technology or communications in the context of, let's say, the First Amendment. Then, of course, you get to the 2022 decision, a true originalist uh, masterpiece, if you will, the Nice Surfer versus Bruin case that really, I like to say, reaffirms in all respects the Heller decision, but this time they do it in what I like to say a paint-by-numbers way. And what if you read Bruin carefully, what they're really saying is, look, in Heller, we taught the lower courts that you start with the text of the Second Amendment, then we shift the burden to the government to show there's some exception using history or perhaps tradition or some sort of traditional history. And really, the lower courts between 2008 and 2022 were bollocksing all of this up. So in the Bruin case, they really reaffirmed the Heller methodology of interpreting the Second Amendment and do it in a paint-by-numbers way by spelling it out going so far to articulate the legal standard in Bruin twice in that opinion. And again, that legal standard is if a modern day gun control law or a proposed conduct by an individual is implicated, is implicated by the text of the Second Amendment, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, then at that point, that behavior is presumptively protected and that gun control law or regulation is presumptively unconstitutional and unenforceable under the Second Amendment. But that just means the burden shifts to the government to show if they can a long-standing, long-standing legal tradition of actual laws on the books or actual common law that shows there's some sort of understandable long-standing restriction on the right of the people to keep and bear arms. And that is what they said in Bruin. And of course, in the Bruin case, uh, they said there is no long-standing tradition of preventing Americans from being able to, from being allowed under the Second Amendment 
uh, or have the right to carry guns uh, in society uh, freely, that is the right, and that was always understood, and there are very narrow exceptions to such a right. So the question is, what does Rahimi mean in this fabric of Second Amendment cases? And what I think Rahimi really means is it's the first case where the Second Amendment jurisprudence goes from groundbreaking decisions to more pedestrian you know, fine tuning of the methodology and resolving particular cases. Because if you look at the Rahimi decision, even though there is a dissent by Clarence Thomas, which we will get to in a few minutes, uh, it really is a 9-0 decision that the Bruin methodology of text first, burn shifting to the government to come forth with a longstanding historical tradition of firearms regulation uh, to justify the law if they can do it, i.e. the government can do it. Um, that methodology was reaffirmed nine to zero. And again, it just goes to show you that I think the Rahimi case is more of a typical constitutional case where we're now going to try to fine tune and draw lines around a particular methodology. So with that said, I think if you're, and I, I, I just want to digress briefly and say, I, I tell this to a lot of my friends that are you know, very focused on the theory and the notions of originalism. In my view, and I think the Supreme Court understands this, if you really are a proponent of originalism, if you believe that originalism, which is the text and the founding era history and the public understanding at the time of the founding, is the touch, uh, is the is the key, uh, the touchstone to interpreting the Constitution, then you really need to be cheering for the Supreme Court to get originalism right in the context of the Second Amendment. And the reason why I say that is, unlike so many other areas of the Constitution, the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, and so on and so on, the Second Amendment is really, in many respects, more of a blue ocean situation where the court is able to develop Second Amendment jurisprudence without being burdened by uh, the barnacles of decades and decades of arguably liberal judicial activism or just court judicial activism. And as a consequence, if one cannot make originalism work in the context of the Second Amendment, then you're never going to be able to restore the rest of American law, in my view, uh, to an ocean of originalism. Because again, you're not trying to write around or deal with barnacles or precedents uh, that never should have been decided because they were decided inconsistent with the modes and methods of originalism, so that's why I say even if you're not a you're not a, a gun person or you're not a Second Amendment person, whatever you want to call that, uh, you still, if you're interested in legal theory, need to be very much focused on Second Amendment jurisprudence and what the court does with it, because again, they're not weighed down with barnacles such as tiers of scrutiny that we see in other contexts. Now, with that said, I want to talk just briefly about why this case was so important and what the Supreme Court did was so important in the Rahimi case, even though its actual holding uh, is relatively narrow and really pedestrian in the end. You see, in the context of what Rahimi was really about, the harsh reality is this, in my view, that the Biden administration, the Department of Justice, saw the facts the facts of Mr. Zaki Rahimi, the facts of this case as being so over the top, terribly bad that I think that those that support the notion of expansive gun control laws really saw the Rahimi fact pattern on this record to be a great opportunity for them to roll back or even destroy the Bruin methodology and eliminate the notions of originalism in Second Amendment jurisprudence and bring back notions of tiers of scrutiny, which as you know, tiers of scrutiny is interest balancing or means end scrutiny, whatever you want to call it. But really it's just a euphemism for allowing government judges to have an excuse to roll back or curtail fundamental constitutional rights. That's what all of that tiers of scrutiny interest balancing is. And I will say without spoiling uh, the ending here that the US Supreme Court in Rahimi undeniably repeatedly repu repudiated and said, no way, no how are we gonna ever bring back or have ever interest balancing in the context of the Second Amendment. That was clear, not just from the majority opinion that reaffirmed the Bruin methodology. It was also crystal clear from all the concurrences by Justice Barrett, Justice Gorsuch, and Justice Kavanaugh. Now, with that said, uh, one needs to step back and understand why the Rahimi case was important in context. 
After the Bruin decision in 2022, obviously there were hundreds and hundreds of Second Amendment challenges all across the country involving issues, whether it be government-mandated gun-free zones, sometimes referred to as sensitive places. Uh, you had the quote-unquote assault weapon ban cases, which are really just bans on semi-automatic rifles, uh, no different than the handguns in Heller, except they're long and rifles. Same concept, though, they're all semi-automatic. You had fights about licensing regimes in certain areas of the country where they still may it hard to get a concealed carry permit. And you had fights about age, meaning do 18, 19, and 20 year olds have the same Second Amendment rights as um, you know, a, a, adults uh, who are older than the age of 20? Um, tax issues, whether or not targeted taxes on guns and ammunition are consistent with the Constitution and so on and so on. So you, you, you had a just gestalt of Second Amendment litigation going on between 2022 and 2023. Now, here's the key to understand why the Rahimi case is so important. There were two sort of general sets of cases going on involving the Second Amendment. On the one hand, you had, I mean, sort of public interest litigation, if you will, not always public interest litigation, but you had basically civil litigants that were suing to vindicate Second Amendment rights. Some of those may have been supported by, uh, you know, gun rights, nonprofits or whatever. Some of them may have just been individuals that felt there was a wrong in their community. And there were these sort of lawsuits being brought to challenge modern day gun control laws using the Second Amendment as the weapon to knock them out. But then you had this entire other set or bucket of cases, and this is where Rahimi comes from, is the second bucket. And that is you had a whole host of criminal defendants with records, shall we say, that might not be as crystal clean as one might want if you're bringing like a test case involving the Constitution. So you had a lot of these sort of criminal public defenders representing criminals, and they did yeoman work here, not just in Rahimi, but in other cases, to really try to fight and vindicate as well they should, as well as they're ethically obligated to do, to raise all the conceivable defenses to uh, gun control indictments on behalf of their criminal defendant clients. And it was from that bucket of cases out of which the Rahimi case arose. Specifically, just to let you know how bad the facts are of Rahimi, these are so bad that Chief Justice John Roberts in the Rahimi decision actually felt the need to outline them in some detail just to show you what an extreme outlier set of facts these were and how different diametrically opposed or on the opposite end of the spectrum of dealing with law by an ordinary American's right to keep and bear arms. I mean, Mr. Rahimi in December 2019, for example, got into a fight with his girlfriend uh, who was they also shared a child with, got into a fight with his girlfriend in a parking lot. Uh, he dragged her into this car. He hit her head against the dashboard. And, and that is, as if that's not bad enough, there was a witness, apparently he, he thought saw the incident and he pulled out a gun and shot at the witness. Um, and then, and, and that was the incident, by the way, that gave rise to the domestic violence restraining order that Mr. Rahimi, and this is key, Mr. Rahimi in Texas state court admitted to this conduct. He consented to the entry of the restraining order. He consented to giving up his right to keep and bear arms. He admitted to all the stuff. So we knew about the hearing. He appeared at the hearing. He had an opportunity to be heard and he admitted and consented to all this bad conduct. And it was from that, that the state of Texas entered a protective order that said that Mr. Rahimi could be, would be among other things, disarmed. And of course, once that happens under 18 USC 922 G8, he was not allowed under federal law to possess firearms. But to, to make the record even worse when it comes to what a bad guy Mr. Rahimi was, after the entry of this restraining order, after he beat up his girlfriend and shot at a witness, he then goes on, I kid you not, take a look at the opinion of Rahimi and you'll see what I'm talking about. He literally is a suspect in five. That's number five. Uh, other additional shootings, including shooting in the air after he was improperly charged for a burger at a restaurant, uh, at a fast food joint, and all sorts of other things. So it was these five shootings that arose after the entry of the restrainer that gave rise to a search warrant where when the police searched his home, they found not only that he possessed firearms, they actually found his restrainer that said he wasn't allowed to have guns. That is how bad the factual scenario was. The factual record was on this case. So Mr. Rahimi pled guilty in federal court to violating 922 G8 because there's no dispute that he had guns. There was no dispute that he was subject to this restraining order. But he argued, of course, that he wanted to preserve his Second Amendment appeal rights. And the court said, that's fine. Argue the Second Amendment. The law is not constitutional. All you want, that's perfectly fine. So he goes up to the Fifth Circuit initially. And the Fifth Circuit says, 
Um, no, the law is upheld. But then after that, the Bruin decision in 2022 is decided by the Supreme Court. When that occurs, then what happens is, of course, Mr. Rahimi renews his argument that the 18 U.S.C. 922 G8 statute is unconstitutional on its face. And in that instance, the Fifth Circuit actually up. Uh, actually struck down the law, and they did so on the grounds that uh, the federal government could not identify a sufficient number of laws on the books that would allow the disarmament of these kinds of things for people subject to domestic violence restraining orders. As soon as the Fifth Circuit, and this is why I say this is uh, the context is important for understanding the significance of Rahimi and what the court did and did not do in the decision, is as soon as this uh, Fifth Circuit decision was issued, Merrick Garland and the Solicitor General's Office for the Biden administration clearly understood, and they're very smart, they're very good lawyers, uh, they have an agenda, obviously, and they know exactly what they're doing. So they wisely, from their point of view, immediately decided to take advantage of these terrible facts, and they immediately sought a petition for cert to the U.S. Supreme Court. They didn't wait. They didn't do anything. They literally rushed to the Supreme Court and, and expedited this in all respect because it was pretty clear the Biden administration wanted to make sure that the next Second Amendment case to be decided after Bruin was not one of those sort of test cases where you have a sympathetic Second Amendment supporter plaintiffs, but was instead someone who obviously was a terrible criminal ne'er-do-well uh, to stress test, if you will, to see if that gave rise to an opportunity to use the theory of bad facts make bad law to in, in, indeed destroy or water down the Bruin methodology in some terrible way that would justify all sorts of gun control laws. And of course, that is what the Supreme Court, uh, well, the Supreme Court didn't do that. We'll get to that in one second. But the Supreme Court granted cert because, again, a federal statute had been declared unconstitutional in one of the circuits down there in Texas and Louisiana by the Fifth Circuit. And the Supreme Court, obviously recognizing that the SG's office wanted this case to be heard, they granted cert and heard the case. So that is the context of how the Second Amendment case that arose after Bruin involves such a, a terrible record, uh, a real guy who, obviously, on this record, uh, should be locked up and put you know, the key should be thrown away for a very long period of time on this crazy track record. So the question is, did the Department of Justice succeed in justifying all sorts of gun control laws after the uh, Rahimi decision? And I think the answer is, is really undeniably no. So it, in light of all this, the question is, what can we glean from the Rahimi decision itself? Well, the first thing is, the attempt to knock out the Bruin methodology, which really, if you think about it, is the Heller methodology reaffirmed by Bruin, that methodology of you look at the text of the Second Amendment, and then the burn shifts to the government if a monetary gun control law implicates the text. And then once the burn shifts, the government bears the burden to come forth with a longstanding historical tradition of firearms regulation consistent with or analogous to the modern gun control law. And if they can't do it, the gun control law cannot be enforced under the Second Amendment. And the question is, what did the Supreme Court do when they were faced with these incredibly terrible set of facts and an attack on the Bruin methodology? And the answer is, in a nine to zero decision, really, they said that the Bruin methodology is indeed uh, going to remain the law of the land. Uh, Clarence Thomas, in his dissent, reaffirmed the Bruin methodology. He, ha he had a, a debate about one aspect of it, which we'll get to in a few minutes. But really, even the uh, Judge Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, uh, and Justice Brown Jackson all said that maybe they don't like the methodology of Heller and Bruin, but the reality is they acknowledge that is the law of the land. So if you're a lower inferior court today, you have a 9-0, a 9-0 unanimous decision that says the methodology to apply in Second Amendment cases is the Heller-Bruin methodology of text first burden shifting and then a historical analog analysis. So that is a huge vindication of not just the Second Amendment for that methodology, but also for originalism that you have a unanimous court uh, basically agreeing on the methodology, even though there may be a debate about the application of it in some cases. So that's the first thing. The second takeaway that one must understand from this decision in Rahimi is that tiers of scrutiny, interest balancing is out the window. There was an attempt to bring this back. And if you look at the concurrence by Judge Sotomayor, Justice Sotomayor, she's trying to bring back tiers of scrutiny by having a discussion of gun violence and domestic violence and how bad it is, which no one disputes it's bad. But despite that, um, egging on, if you will, the majority of the Supreme Court 
majority opinion made very clear that the consequences of the law are not the focus. It's the text and the history of the Second Amendment and the American history of firearms regulation, of which there's not a lot out there, going back to the founding. Uh, that is the focus of how you decide Second Amendment cases. So the court did not talk about the consequences of it. They did not say this is good or bad policy. They literally strictly interpreted the Second Amendment by text and then history. And that, of course, is very much an originalist approach. The third thing, and I'll give you like the list of these uh, takeaways and then open this up uh, for questions. The third thing that the Rahimi uh, decision reaffirms in both Heller and Caetano is they reaffirm that modern firearms, modern firearms are uh, as protected as um, firearms or weapons or arms that existed at the time of the founding. In fact, there's even a line in Justice Roberts Chief Justice Roberts' opinion, where he makes reference to the fact that it would just be absurd to think that the only thing protected would be like sabers and muskets. So again, the Supreme Court reaffirms that modern firearms are protected, and that's significant for, let's say, the assault weapon type cases, the AR-15 cases that may be coming down the pike. So that's the third critical takeaway from the rationale and reasoning of the Supreme Court's decision in Rahimi. Uh, the fourth is, again, the text controls. What's quite interesting is there really wasn't a lot of discussion about the text here because there was no dispute that Mr. Rahimi was an American because he's an American. He's part of the people, as in the right of the people to keep him arms shall not be infringed. The Supreme Court had previously defined the people to consist of everyone uh, that has like a direct link, if you will, to our national community that obviously would at a minimum include American citizens. Mr. Rahimi was an American citizen, is an American citizen. So there was really just a passing reference to the fact, obviously, that the Second Amendment applied to him. So the entire Rahimi decision is really focused on what constitutes a historical tradition of firearms regulation and what counts as such. And once that counts, how is that interpreted? So the next thing is, uh, the fifth takeaway I have here is, again, there's another 9-0 decision that says that the burden is on the government. The burden is on the government to come forth with a historical, a uh, longstanding tradition of a particular type of firearms regulation before the uh, text of the Second Amendment can be overcome and an exception can be created. And if we'll get to uh, in one second just how robust the historical tradition was of disarming uh, or you know, taking away the rights of people that were known to be violent and dangerous, it was a pretty robust tradition here. Uh, the next, uh, I, I would say that sort of the sixth takeaway here is that the Supreme Court said that the government, the Department of Justice in this particular case, really supplied a massive amount of longstanding evidence, historical evidence that you could disarm people that were known to be and were found to be uh, violent dangers to society. They said that in this case, it was overwhelmingly the case. Now, the question is, uh, is that significant and how so? And I think this is particularly significant. And I think a lot of commentators don't quite understand this nuance of what the court did. If you think about it, once the text is satisfied and the burden shifts to the government, then there has to be, then the government has to show again, a longstanding tradition a, a particular type of firearms regulation. So there's really, if you think about it, two thresholds that have to be satisfied uh, once the burden shifts to the government to justify a modern day gun control law. The first threshold that has to be overcome by the government is you have to identify a tradition, a tradition. Before you talk about uh, anything else and how does that tradition fit within a modern day gun control context, the first step is, do you have a tradition? And this is particularly significant because in the Bruin case, they rejected on multiple occasions in 2022, the court did uh, a bunch of examples where they said, well, there's like a, a handful of territorial laws or there's a few laws in one state and maybe four laws here. And the Supreme Court in Bruin says, yeah, none of that is enough to establish a tradition. But here in Rahimi, there actually was a sufficient amount of laws to give rise to a tradition. And I think this is particularly important because let's see what laws the Supreme Court relied on Rahimi that gave rise to a tradition. And they're very robust. In fact, both bodies of laws involve discussions by none other than people like William Blackstone in his commentaries and Hawkins. In other words, these are like longstanding ubiquitous laws that were on the books, not just in jolly old England, but also here in the early Americas and the early United States. And those laws that the uh, Supreme Court found to be a tradition of restrictions on firearms involve first a 
criminal set of statutes known as the affray laws. Now, the affray laws uh, are criminal laws at the time of the founding, and they essentially exist even today. And basically what they say is, if you go out in public, if you go out and you basically terrorize the people, right? You, it's kind of a little bit analogous to the statute of Northampton to some degree, which I know you guys have heard about before. But basically the affray laws, like if you go out and you engage in all sorts of criminal conduct and you scare people with guns or you misbehave, you get into riots and mob behavior, et cetera, et cetera, that is dangerous and you're terrorizing the public. And in that instance, we can put you in prison. So the Supreme Court in Rahimi really identified in two bodies of law. The first one were the affray laws, which were the criminal cases that said, if you you engage in a fray like behavior or a fray behavior, you get to go to prison. That's a criminal punishment, a criminal punishment. And because those were on the books at the time of the founding, they've been on the books for hundreds of years. They were basically in every state. They were so ubiquitous that they even found their way into commentaries like William Blackstone's commentaries. You cannot claim in any respect these are like outlier laws that some random jurisdiction somewhere enacted. So the fray laws was the one set of laws that the Supreme Court uh, hung its legal hat on to justify uh, 922 G8. But then it went on and say there's another body of laws, which was also well established in the common law, and then some early American states adopted this. Those were known as the surety statutes. Now, the way to understand this, uh, if you want to get geeky here, is the affray laws were the criminal justice punishment laws at the time of the founding, all around the time of the founding, all the jurisdictions. And then you have had the surety laws, which were really the civil, what I call preventative justice laws, civil preventative justice laws, where again, the way the surety laws worked in the United States and in England was essentially this. If you were found, and this is key, if you were found to misbehave and to demonstrate that you were somehow a violent danger to someone else under the surety laws, then there had to be a trial, there had to be a finding that you were a potential danger. If that occurred, Usually you had a you had an option. You could either post a bond, and if you posted the bond, you could actually continue to carry gun. That was true. Or if you could not post a bond, they put you in prison. So what the Supreme Court said is they viewed the affray laws and the surety laws, and they said, well, the surety laws are analogous and a tradition of restricting firearms ownership for people that have been found to have engaged in dangerous conduct or may engage in dangerous conduct going forward based on a factual record uh, found by a court. And they said, yeah, and this gets into the Clarence Thomas dissent, where Justice Thomas is like, look, the surety laws are just not sufficiently analogous to 922 uh, uh 922 G8, and that's a legitimate fight about the how uh, these laws worked at the time of the founding. But the Supreme Court majority says, well, we think it's close enough because, again, if you posted a bond, yeah, you could keep hair and a gun. But if you didn't post the bond, you got put in prison and lost your right to keep in arms. And we think that really the modern day 922 G8 kind of falls in the middle on that spectrum. And again, you can have a legitimate debate about that how between the modern day gun control laws on the one hand and the how of surety laws at the time of the founding. But the Supreme Court thought in this particular instance, uh, it was a close enough fit. Now, I do want to say there was a major blow to uh, really, if you, you know, to people that support gun control law in the context of this discussion about uh, tradition and what kind of laws are acceptable. The Department of Justice in this Rahimi case argued that the tradition, the tradition that comes out of the affray laws and the tradition that came out of the surety laws and the other traditions that come out of other laws at the time of the founding was a tradition of allowing for the disarmament or punishment, if you will, of people who were not responsible, not responsible. So the DOJ was arguing for, if we can show that you as an American citizen are not responsible or are irresponsible, we can disarm you. We can disarm you. Now, the Supreme Court 9-0, because Justice Thomas's dissent reaffirmed that he agreed with this, 9-0, the Supreme Court says, that is undeniably not the law, and we reject that wholeheartedly. In other words, they say that just because so, even if someone is not responsible, whatever that means, they say, we don't even know what that means, uh, that is just not going to be a basis for being disarmed or taking away your right to keep in arms. That is a no-go zone. So the Department of Justice is trying to argue not responsible, allow them to take away guns. The Supreme Court says that is absolutely not acceptable. That is rejected. And that is not consistent with the Second Amendment. So that alone is a very favorable ruling in support of a broad interpretation of the right of the people to keep and bear arms. But they did say, and this was not really a shock, that 
if you are found to be a credible threat of violence towards someone else, guess what? You can be disarmed. And again, rem remember what I said at the beginning of this, the holding was you can be disarmed temporarily, temporarily. They didn't say that if you're found to be uh, a violent threat to someone, you can be disarmed forever. They said temporarily. Presumably, that means during the time period in which you are deemed or are a credible threat of violence toward someone else. Now, there's just a few other things that I think are worth noting that if you, from this Rahimi decision, and then I'll open it up to questions. Um, Justice Kavanaugh made it very clear. It's very interesting here because in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Department of Justice cited to a whole host of like racist, bigoted uh, laws from America's history. But then when they got before the Supreme Court, the Department of Justice dropped all those laws and didn't argue them. And Justice Kavanaugh really reaffirmed that uh, racist laws, laws along those lines, uh, really, I think the sort of the anti-Native American laws, the anti-Black laws, this kind of thing, uh, they're not going to be acceptable historical analogs. In fact, specifically what Justice Kavanaugh writes is, um, it, it, well, let me get this straight here. I want to say it because it's a very good line. Um, I don't want to let's see that I get this right. Uh, okay, now I'm not. Oh, here it is. I apologize. Got a lot of notes here. So this is what Justice Kavanaugh writes. He says that the lower courts must exercise caution. The lower courts must exercise caution in applying Bruin to the historical methodology to make sure, quote, they must exercise care to rely only on the history that the Constitution actually incorporated and not on the history that the Constitution left behind. That's very important to understand that the Justice Kavanaugh, basically with that reference in the concurrence and really DOJ's kind of concession that those laws are no good, is essentially saying that we're not going to consider any racist gun control laws um, because a lot of the gun control laws in American history were quite racist. And that has been discussed by the Supreme Court before. And Justice Kavanaugh says, yeah, don't ever bring those cases up to us because we don't ever, we're never going to view those as a basis to establish a uh, tradition of firearms regulation that a government actor can use to justify justify a modern day gun control law or a second amendment restriction. Um, and the only other, let's see, is there anything else I want to get to before? Oh, the only other thing, and this is quite important. Uh, again, I think to summarize what the Rahimi case was about is it really was a vindication of originalism. It was a vindication of the Bruin methodology, which is really the Heller methodology. And I think it shows that this court is never going to go back in the context of the Second Amendment uh, to interest balancing. They're not going to get into good guns, bad guns, gun violence, any of that stuff. They're going to be very much lawyerly and judge-like and apply the text and the history of the Constitution in resolving these cases. And I think the shift that we're seeing, the paradigm shift, is really that the Second Amendment uh, jurisprudence is starting to mature and they're going from groundbreaking decisions. And again, they're moving into what I call uh, pedestrian judges. A, a pedestrian judicial decision making, which is not to suggest it's not important, by the way, I'm not saying that at all, but more of the routine uh, dr line drawn that we see uh, in Supreme Court jurisprudence today in the context of the Fourth Amendment, the First Amendment, whatever, you know, they're building on this body of law that exists. And I think we're going to see a lot more line drawn going forward. But I think the big thing to also to take away is that the to establish a tradition of a longstanding firearms regulation is going to be a pretty heavy lift for the government moving forward forward. And if that tradition is not so ubiquitous and sort of in existence time immemorial to have found its way into Hawkins, Joseph Story, uh, William Blackstone, these kinds of things, uh, I think it's going to be pretty hard to establish a tradition to justify a lot of these modern day gun control laws. Uh, but again, only time will tell. So anyway, there you have it. Um, you know, I'm ha happy to answer any questions and, uh, you know, you know, we're happy to break it down even further. But I think this gives you a pretty good overview of how to view Rahimi in the context of modern day Second Amendment law. Got it. Well, thanks so much. Really appreciate that background as breakdown of the decision, the opinions and we we're out with this case. Uh, we do have a, a bunch of questions from our audience. So excited to be turning to those now. Uh, for those of you who haven't submitted questions, but do have them, I'll remind you that you can do that via the Q&A feature and we can jump on in. Our first audience question uh, asks about Justice Jackson's concurring opinion, where she uh, argues the court is at fault for inferior courts misunderstanding Bruin. Does, do you think this means she will push for the court to hear more Second Amendment cases? I, I, I suspect that Justice Brown Jackson, first of all, I think uh, her take on the lower courts and their application of the Second Amendment is uh, not accurate. 
I think what you're seeing is, and this is kind of, if I can step back and put this into context, because this is something that gets lost in the weeds uh, with like media reporting on Second Amendment cases, and that's this. <clears throat> if you think for a moment about where most gun control laws are enacted as a practical matter, right? They're enacted in these uh, deep blue states uh, that are controlled by, you know, people that are generally pro-gun control, uh, California, New Jersey, New York. Uh, and so on, right? You know, you know the usual suspects, and the legal challenges to a lot of these local gun control laws go before judges who have been picked for the federal bench by local United States senators, and they often have, of course, sort of a bias against guns and against the Second Amendment. So, I think what really is going on here is what we saw to some degree between Heller in 2008 and Bruin in 2022, which is that these Second Amendment challenges a lot of times come up in jurisdictions that are hostile to Second Amendment rights. So a lot of these judges, and I cover this quite extensively on my channel, the Four Boxes Diner Second Amendment channel, if you look at what they're doing, a lot of them um, either either they are ignorant of the Second Amendment or they feign ignorance in many respects as I see it and really are engaging in a form of massive resistance to the Second Amendment. We saw this before Bruin and we're seeing it even after Bruin in certain jurisdictions. And one of the excuses is that originalism in history is too hard to apply. But obviously this is utterly hooey. And don't just take my opinion. Take a look at what the Supreme Court said in Rahimi. If you look carefully what the Justice Robert, just Chief Justice Roberts writes in Rahimi, he makes it very clear on at least one, maybe even two occasions that researching and understand the text of the Constitution or statute or whatever, and then looking at the history associated with it is right down the middle of what judges and lawyers do on a daily basis. And I think this is quite significant because the Supreme Court is reaffirming again that you don't need to bring in like expert historians to research the history of laws. Because remember what the Supreme Court is talking about when they discuss that historical tradition. It's not a cultural historical tradition. They're not looking for, uh, you know, you know, discussions of period uh, clothes or hats or fashion or music. No, the only thing the Supreme Court cares about in the context of Second Amendment history is this. Is there a longstanding history or traditional history of laws, of regulations on the books that were ubiquitous, that were enforceable from the time of our founding forward? Laws. Now, who are the experts in American life for finding laws with historical bases. Oh, that would be called lawyers and judges, which is what we do every single day. That's all lawyers do. You look for historical precedents. That doesn't mean you have to be a professional historian because all you're trying to do is identify laws. You're trying to identify a number of laws. And then from there, you try to draw an inference. Is this give rise to a tradition or not? And that again involves analogical reasoning, which lawyers do every day. So I think that what Justice Brown Jackson is interested in is trying to indicate and make an excuse for originalism is too hard. History is too hard. We should go back to tiers of scrutiny to interest balancing, which again allows government judges to balance away your constitutional rights. And this Supreme Court is saying that is not going to happen. And again, there's nothing hard about doing history um, when it comes to legal history, which is what we're talking about, because all you have to do is look in the case books and the U.S. reports is nothing but legal history. Right. And that's what we look at every day. Thank you. That, that was very helpful. We've had a couple audience questions on red flag laws. Uh, does this case seem like it could expand red flag laws or begin to overturn them? I think I, I think the fight about red flag laws um, is really a version of civil commitment laws. And what I mean by this is so so Rahimi, the holding in Rahimi helps advance civil commitment laws and red flag laws in one sense, but it doesn't do anything for it in another. And what I mean by that is this, one of the dogs that did not bark in the Rahimi case is the question of due process. And if you may recall at the beginning of this presentation, I said that Mr. Rahimi himself, he showed up at his state court hearing over whether or not to enter, enter a restraining order. He showed up, he knew about it, 
He appeared. He admitted to doing these things. He consented to the entry of the order and all these things. He never argued. He never argued due process at any point in time until due process popped up, I think, in some amicus briefs uh, before the Supreme Court in Rahimi. But Mr. Rahimi himself waived his due process argument that was referenced by uh, the court in Rahimi. They said, look, we're not getting into due process here because it was waived. It's not before us, but obviously that's going to be an issue down the road. So when it comes to red flag laws, and I think, again, this is a, this is a type of civil commitment, just to step back. Since the time of the founding, if 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 you are found to be a danger to yourself or others, there have been versions of civil commitment laws in various ways that say, look, if you're dangerous because you're mentally ill, you know, we can basically lock you up in a sense and keep you safe because you're not able to like walk around, uh, you know, not able to walk around society in a safe way because you're mentally sick, right? That's what civil commitment laws are. But here's the key. Civil commitment statutes have, over the many decades, established a very robust due process protection system. So if you can't afford someone to defend you in a civil commitment proceeding where they're trying to basically lock you up in a mental health institution, you get government-appointed lawyers, government-appointed experts. There has to be a trial with evidence to show that you truly are mentally ill to the point where you can't be in society. You have to be locked away in a mental institution for treatment. Now, red flag laws is really a... Uh, political propaganda phrase that's designed to allow for shortcuts from that robust due process associated with the civil commitment process. But if you think about it, it, the Second Amendment is undeniably a fundamental right. That's what the Supreme Court has repeatedly said, including McDonald, that the right to keep and bear arms is a fundamental right, no less fundamental than any other liberty interest that we have in this country, including uh, the right to, to travel, the right to be free. So it seems to me the, the reason why I mention all this is at the end of the day, the fight about red flag laws is not about whether or not we can uh, lock you up, uh, disarm you if you're shown to be a violent danger to yourself or to others. The fight over red flag laws is always, uh, do you allow these red flag laws to function as a shortcut around due process protections we see in other contexts where we take away fundamental rights and fundamental liberties. And that's where the fight's going to be. And the Rahimi case doesn't do anything about that. All they say is, and there was no shock when this holding, if you truly are a danger to yourself or to others, even though they didn't talk about yourself, I think that's what they also mean, then we can do something to you to make sure that you're safe and to make sure people around you are safe. And I think when there comes to red flag laws, the real fight, the rubber's going to hit the road on how much due process... If you support red flags and you don't like guns, then you're going to want basically no due process. You're going to want a rubber stamp to be sufficient to disarm people. But if you support the right to keep in arms and you think it's a fundamental right, you're going to want to make sure that there's the same due process protections associated with putting someone in prison or putting someone in uh, involuntary commitment into a mental health hospital. Thanks again. Appreciate it. We have a couple of audience questions on the precedent that this sets and its potential impact moving forward. Uh, one asks, could Rahimi be used to challenge lifetime firearms deprivations for defendants convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence type charges? Well, I think that the way to approach questions like that is, what is the tradition that was identified by the Supreme Court in Rahimi and what does Rahimi itself find? And I think and this was not a particularly big leap to reach this conclusion. There is a tradition, I think, in this country that if you are physically violent danger, if you are physically and violently dangerous, and I don't mean metaphorically dangerous, like, oh, you're a danger to democracy. No, no I'm talking about like if, if you are if found to be in a court of law after a due process in a trial of some sort, you are found to be a physically violent danger to yourself or to someone else, then I think you can be disarmed uh, during the period of time that you are viewed or are considered to be a danger. So I think that when you look at the famous like Martha Stewart case, like why, you know, there's a, many people discuss, why does Martha Stewart, who went to prison for lying to the FBI, why should she be disarmed for life? Because uh, she committed a felony by lying to the FBI and was convicted. And I think the Supreme Court is not going to uphold those kinds of laws going forward. I think they're going to go along the lines of what we saw that the United States Court of Appeals did in the Third Circuit out of New Jersey and Pennsylvania in the Range case that said, if you truly are not not violent and you've been convicted of something uh, that is 
a uh, that that is you know that is technically a felony under the law or that defines a statutory law, but you're not a danger to yourself and you're not a danger to other people and you're not violent today. Uh, I think the Supreme Court is probably going to say you can't be disarmed. That you can only disarm people that are right here and right now violently dangerous to themselves and to others. And I think that the Rahimi precedent is consistent with that, where they talk about even Mr. Rahimi. With this terrible record that I gave to you involved with five shootings and beating up his girlfriend and shooting at witnesses, even with that record, the holding was that he can be temporarily disarmed after there was a hearing that found him to be a credible threat to others. Thanks. Uh, an audience member actually follows up on that temporarily uh, question. They ask, what is the process of determining a person is no longer a threat? Is there a time period and, and how is that initiated? Well, there's a couple of different ways of answering that question. I'm only pausing for a second because there's something that I, I want to bring to everyone's attention that's just kind of interesting. And, and, and it's kind of more of a statutory thing than a constitutional thing. But I think it's kind of interesting to be aware of this in the context of what are known as restoration of rights. There is a federal statute out there that actually allows the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. I believe they're the adjudicator, I think, um, to determine that someone can have their Second Amendment rights, their right to keep their arms restored. But this is kind of as a side note, Congress for many, many years has not funded that statute, which means even though you have a statutory right to seek the restoration of your Second Amendment rights, because that program has not been funded by Congress, there's no mechanism in the law in many respects to basically have your rights restored through that process that federal statutory law contemplates. So if you want to vindicate your rights and claim that you are no longer a danger and you want your rights restored, the proper process today, as I see it, Kayla, is someone has to bring, you have to bring a lawsuit like Brian Range did uh, in Pennsylvania in the Third Circuit. And you have to sue to say, I am not a danger. I am not violent. Uh, you know, maybe in the past there's a problem. I'm not whatever. But today I'm not. And I am entitled to my full-blown right to keep and bear arms. And because I'm not violent, I'm not dangerous to anybody or myself, I should have my rights restored. So the only way to mechanically do that now, I think, is to really bring suit to try to get a declaration uh, and an injunction that you cannot be prevented from uh, keeping and bearing arms. But this is an area of law that is developing. I should note that the Department of Justice just on Monday after Rahimi uh, filed a request to the U.S. Supreme Court to have the Supreme Court hear a bunch more 922G cases uh, to try to flesh out uh, who is allowed to be a prohibited person under the Constitution and who cannot be a prohibited person, where the definition of prohibited person means uh, that you can be disarmed. We actually had not as a member asked about those. Do you have a, a sense of which of those cases might be granted cert? Well, it's hard to guess what the Supreme Court's going to do, obviously. Predicting the Supreme Court is very difficult. Um, if I were on the Supreme Court and I wanted to take another prohibited person case, I would probably take the range case. And, and if you think about it from a kind of an extreme point of view, you've already the Supreme Court has already decided. Uh, one extreme case in terms of Mr. Rahimi's record is about as extreme as one can get with involving all these shootings and violence and, and admission of guilt and so on. So you got that on the one extreme of kind of bad fact patterns. Uh, then you have someone like a Mr. Range, and there are probably others out there that where there's no indication in anywhere in his history or anywhere in the record of any aspect of violence in any respect. And that would be kind of like the opposite extreme. So you got Rahimi on the violent extreme, and then you have someone like Brian Range on the opposite extreme, the nonviolent extreme. So probably the right answer if I were the Supreme Court is I would take uh, like the Range case or something like the Range case and try to say, okay, this is we're not going to disarm you if you uh, are perfectly nonviolent. We will disarm you if you're found to be violent. And then over a period of time, the Supreme Court can start to fill in the gaps and try to figure out where where do drug dealers fall on that spectrum? Are they more violent or are they more of the nonviolent? If you're just a drug user with a marijuana card, where do you fall on the spectrum? And so on and so on. And I think that's probably the way to do it, to create kind of the, 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 the benchmarks for the violent side and the benchmarks for the nonviolent side. And then over a period of time, you can figure out where the line falls with all those other kind of cases. Got it. Does this case, uh, sorry, an audience member asked, does this case eliminate uh, second facial challenges or could someone still bring one of those? Uh, I think facial challenges are, are absolutely still in the works. Again, I think that when you're, when you're dealing with 922G cases, which deals with prohibited people, right? 
you really do have to, in many aspects, deal with a uh, individualized determination, right? Um, is the person violent? Is he not violent? Is he a danger? Is she a danger? So I think when you're dealing with prohibited people, that's all about individualized determinations. Now, when you're dealing with, let's say, declaring Times Square a gun-free zone as a sensitive place, that's a facial challenge, even if maybe there's some aspects in Times Square that could be deemed sensitive, arguably. But no, I think that although I think most of gun control laws uh, can be uh, brought on a facial basis, just like Bruin was facial, McDonald was facial, uh, uh, well, Katana was a little bit different because she was convicted, uh, Hiller was facial. So no, I think facial challenges are definitely uh, still readily available in the context of the Second Amendment. But when you're dealing with prohibited people under 18 U.S.C. 922G and that list of people of drug users, people that were dishonorably discharged, I think that's going to give rise to a lot more individualized determinations because of the nature of the remedy, meaning you, you, know, you yourself specifically are disarmed because of you yourself conduct. And again, that's much different than just waving a wand that says everyone that has a, a black AR-15 semi-automatic rifle can't have it or go to prison. I think that is much more available, uh, a much more uh, an appropriate vehicle uh, to be challenged with a facial, facial case, facial challenge. Thank you. Next question. Were both affray and surety laws necessary to establish an analogous historical tradition of firearms regulation? Or could either in have been independently sufficient to establish a tradition justifying uh, this law's constitutionality? Oh, I think they were both needed. I think they were both needed. And I think the standard that was been set by this Supreme Court before a tradition can be established is now extremely high. And like I said in my comments, I think this is this part of it has not been fully appreciated and it will be over time. Because again, the surety laws on the civil preventative side of things and the affray laws on the criminal punishment side of things, I think you kind of needed them both together. Uh, one would not one would not necessarily be enough, but here, of course, uh, they work together. So you have that tradition. But no, I think that what really is significant about the fact that the court looked at those two strands and said that was enough for a tradition of disarming violently dangerous people, uh, I think that, though, is a far cry from usually what uh, I see as a commentator and a reporter in the Second Amendment space, uh, where you know they they throw up five or six laws and say, look, you know, uh, this territory in the nineteenth century had this law, and that territory in the late nineteenth century did this, and there was this passing reference in some court case in you know eighteen twenty six in Tennessee, and they try to cobble that together to create a tradition, and that's just not going to be sufficient to give rise to a tradition. I think if it's not in Blackstone, if it's not in Hawkins, if it's not written by, about by Joseph Story and the like, I think the tradition hurdle, which has to be established before you even get into the how, how why metrics and the fit, uh, I think that's going to be pretty hard uh, for those in support of gun control uh, to satisfy. And I think that that, that tradition standard uh, and the height of it, the high bar is going to come, uh, is going to become more obvious as the, the various cases uh, make their way through the systems. Thanks. An audience member question uh, brings up a question concerning the relationship of Rahimi and Bruin, um, whether or not Rahimi adjusts or simply clarifies the standard in Bruin and whether or not moving forward, uh, courts have to cite back to both of them together um, as a singular sort of standard or whether it can just be the Bruin standard is clarified in Rahimi. I'm not sure I would use either of those phrases. I think really what Rahimi is is simply applying Bruin to a particular fact pattern, which is what lawyers and judges do every day, right? We know the four elements of a breach of contract. We know the four elements of you know breach, uh, you know a negligence case, and really uh, we're now at the point where you're going to start applying uh, long, you know, Second Amendment jurisprudence to new fact patterns, to new cases, to new situations, and over time a, a body of law will be developed. So I don't think Rahimi changes Bruin. I think what Rahimi actually does is affirms wholeheartedly in nine to zero, right? Even the uh, the Justice Kagan, the Justice Sotomayor, and Justice Brown Jacksons, even though they don't like to admit it, they basically say, we don't like it, but we admit that the Bruin methodology is the law of the land. So you've got nine Supreme Court justices saying, this is the law, so go forth lower courts and apply it and then uh, you know we'll we'll clear it up as need be. But I don't think the methodology of Bruin has really been modified. Uh, again, you can debate the, because remember the, the debate involving Justice Thomas and the majority is about one narrow aspect of the how 
how were the laws applied at the time of the founding versus how are the laws allowed to be applied today? There was no dispute about the existence of the tradition. There was no dispute about the text. There was no dispute that the burden was on the government to show the tradition. There was no dispute on the why these laws existed. It was really all about the how they were implemented at the time of the founding versus how they're used today. And that's a legitimate debate you can have. Uh, but no, I think that very narrow fight um, is a you know, legitimate argument uh, but at the end of the day, I don't, I, again, I think the Bruin methodology has been re, re, reaffirmed entirely, and that is the law of the land. And then we're just going to have to flesh it out with cases no different than we do in all the rest of the Bill of Rights. Thank you. Well, I know there's a ton more that we could say, but we're almost uh, to the top of the next hour. So any final thoughts on this case? Uh, no, I don't have anything. I, I will say that if people are really interested in getting geeky on the Second Amendment, they should feel free to check out my channel, The Four Boxes Diner on YouTube, where I do really get into like a lot of these details, you know, on a daily basis of Second Amendment law uh, and originalism and, and and this kind of jurisprudence. So if you really are interested in, uh, I'm not sure you would be, but if you're really interested in hearing more from me on a daily basis, you should check out The Four Boxes Diner YouTube channel, uh, where I think I now have over 800 videos on Second Amendment jurisprudence and and we get pretty geeky over there and I try to answer questions and whatnot. So again, if people want to hear more about these kinds of topics, they should definitely check out uh, the Four Boxes Diner YouTube channel because uh, I, I try to cover this basically seven days a week. Well, thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, to appreciate the breakdown of the decision, answering all the questions. It's been a great presentation. And I'm sorry we have to cut it off. I know we could continue to go on for another hour, but we'll have to wrap it there. On behalf of the Federal Society, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you sharing your valuable time and expertise. Thank you also to our audience for joining and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email at fedsocforums at fedsoc.org. And as always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about other upcoming virtual events. With that, thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. Orders up. Table 2A.